Hello and welcome back to the 2024 edition of my Picks and Sight for Dummies Like Me course. In this video, we're just going to focus on stacking, because this was one of the most confusing things for me when I was trying to learn the program. In order to stack your photos in Picks and Sight, you'll go up to Script, Batch Processing, and you're looking for Weighted Batch Preprocessing. Think of this as a suite of tools like Deep Sky Stacker or anything else that does everything you need for you. Why don't we start off at the top? We have bias, dark, flats, lights, calibration, post calibration, and pipeline. Most of the things that we'll be doing are in the lights tab and then the calibration tab. The lights tab, this is where we add in, of course, our light frames. And if you're on Windows, you should see a lights button, flats, darks, etc., down at the bottom. If you're on a Mac, though, I don't think you have all these individual buttons, so you'll need to click on the one and then see the drop down. There's also add custom which could come in handy, we'll talk about that later. But fundamentally, all you have to do is come in WBPP, click on the Add Lights button here at the bottom, navigate to your directory with all of your light frames. In my case, I've got a bunch to choose from. Let's go with, uh, we'll do Andromeda today because I still have some of these files left over. These photos were taken with the 533 monochrome camera. That means I have photos taken with the blue filter, green, H-alpha, luminance, red, and some more. I'm just going to select all of them. You'll note that these are the fit files straight out of the ASI Air. When you've selected all of your light frames, we'll hit open. And one of the things I like about WBPP is that it separates things according to the filter that you used and the exposure time, as well as the gain potentially. What I can see is that I took 300 second long photos with my blue filter, 300 second long photos with my green filter. The same is true for H alpha luminance, and red. And because I used the ASI error, a lot of important metadata was included. In this case, we have the observation time, the rate ascension and declination coordinates, the focal length of my telescope, and even the pixel size of my camera sensor. All of this is helpful to have. If you don't have this information, you're going to be in a much worse position, so you want to make sure that you go back to your data or your ASI error and figure out how to turn all this stuff on. But it should be automatically included in all of your files. We have now loaded in all of our light frames. If you took darks, flats, and bias, or maybe dark flats instead, you can include those as well. I would go to the flats tab next, theoretically, then click on the add flats button at the bottom, grab all my flat frames, hit open, do the same thing for my darks, you get the idea. To be honest though, I don't really bother with flats or darks, and my images look fine. That's because my telescopes have minimal vignette, I don't have any dust spots on my sensor because I keep it clean, and the cameras that I use do not have any amp glow. So if I don't have any vignette, dust spots, or amp glow to worry about, as far as I'm concerned, the calibration frames are a waste of time for my data. And any problems in the data that are still left over after stacking, I know different ways to fix them, which for me is easier than taking the calibration frames. I realize I'm probably one of the few people advocating for this approach, so you can feel free to disregard that information if you see fit. Anyway, once you've loaded in your lights, darks, dark flats, whatever, the next step is to configure all of your settings in the lights header. There's a lot to choose from, including the subframe weighting, the image registration, the astrometric solution, and more. If you just want to keep things as simple as possible though, come up to the presets, click on select, and then choose maximum quality. This will ensure that you're getting the best results out of WBPP. However, if you go with maximum quality and you don't have the world's best computer, and you're taking hundreds of images, there's a chance that the stacking process alone can take upwards of 20 hours in the worst case scenario. That's insane. For this reason, if you are going through with max quality and it's just taking forever and you don't want to deal with that, you can always try faster with good quality or faster with lower quality. That will configure everything to run a bit faster, of course. As I've said before though, I've got a very powerful computer, so I'm going to do max quality with no compromises. Let's talk about the subframe weighting next. One of the cool things with Pixinsight is you can hover over most of these things and it will give you a full written description, which for most of us is going to go over our heads. And for this reason, I'd highly recommend checking out Adam Block. Adam Block has a ton of really in-depth videos on his website, which you can sign up for. And he's the guy that's going to explain all the scientific details behind all these different tools. I've personally learned a lot from Adam Block and I'd recommend again that you check him out to actually understand what all these different things are doing. My goal today is not to explain all the fine details behind everything, but just to give you things as simply as possible. For this reason, I would either use PSF Signal Weight or PSF Scale SNR. 
I find that the signal weight tends to be a bit more restrictive and it will throw out bad photos, so it's probably a good place to start. Then we have image registration. Under the registration parameters, you're best just leaving everything here to the default settings. If you're not sure, the backwards arrow, that will reset everything. Not a bad idea. And the red X will take us back to the previous menu. So there's really nothing to talk about for image registration. Let's move down to astrometric solution. In the image solver parameters, this is something you have to do every single time you run WBPP because your right ascension and declination coordinates will change as you photograph different targets. If you forget to change these settings as you stack a new set of data, you're gonna run into problems. There's two different ways to approach this. If you have your coordinates listed here, you could just transpose them. We have a right ascension in hours, minutes, and seconds. So I could just type in 0, 43, and I'm just gonna cut it right in the middle, maybe 50. It doesn't have to be perfect. Then we have the declination in degrees, minutes, and seconds. In this case, it's 41 by 19, and then about six seconds. Moving over, we have an S with a checkbox. If your declination coordinates have a minus sign, you need to turn on the checkbox for S. If your declination coordinates have a plus sign, the S needs to be turned off. Now for me, it's usually faster and easier to just copy over the settings here to here, but for some of you, you might prefer to click on search instead. You can now enter the name of the target that you are photographing. Then I'll click on search, and it looks like it was able to find it. The coordinates also match pretty closely with what we have here. However, there will be some targets that it will not understand the common name. For example, the Veil Nebula. It has no idea what Veil is. This is where you'll need to research the object and find the NGC number, the M number. For example, IC434. I think that's the horse head. Let's check that out. Well, it's not telling us, but yeah. You can see when you enter the scientific name, it will populate. Then you can hit OK. I'm not going to do that because it's not worth photographing, but you get the idea. Next, you want to confirm that the date and time are correct. And I know that some of you are going to be taking data months apart. In my experience, it really doesn't matter what date you use. Just pick one of the dates that you took photos on. That should be fine. As for the time, I'm usually photographing around midnight, so I'll just put it to midnight. I don't really stress out about this one either. Then we have the focal distance, which has been auto-calculated in the ASI Air to 247. And finally, the pixel size of your camera, which should be listed here. If it's not, you'll need to go to your manufacturer's website and figure that out. When you've got everything configured, make sure you click on the red X. If you accidentally click on the backwards arrow thing that goes back, it will reset everything and you'll have to do it all over again. So again, we click on the red X. That completes the astrometric solution. We have to do that every single time. Moving down, we have local normalization and the normalization parameters. I'm just using the default settings here. That works fine 99% of the time. Then we have the image integration. This is where it stacks everything together. I'd highly recommend leaving auto crop turned on. This will crop out any crap around the edges and ensure you have a nice looking photo to start off your workflow. As for the integration parameters though, the main thing you're gonna be changing in here is the minimum weight. For example, let's say you've manually inspected every single photo and you know that they're sharp. Then you could set this to zero and then theoretically it won't reject any of your photos. Or perhaps you haven't bothered looking at any of your raw files and you're not sure if any of them are sharp. You could use a higher minimum weight. That way it rejects your worst performing photos based on the star size, the amount of clouds, etc. I'm leaving mine set to the default and that generally works fine. The rejection method is normally set to auto and that works great, but if you wanna change it to Sigma clipping or something, you're free to do so. Again, most of the time, just leave everything set to the default and that'll be fine. Now that we've covered all these different settings, I want you to understand that the only one you really have to worry about every time you stack your photos is the astrometric solution. Next, we have the output directory. This is the second thing that you have to adjust every single time. This is where all of your photos will be saved to. And for this reason, we'll click on the folder icon. Normally what I do is I have a folder here for the object's file name, so Crescent Nebula, Cone Nebula, whatever. Inside of that main folder, I'll create a subfolder called PicStack. Now, of course, I don't want to do this today because we're doing Andromeda, but you get the idea. Inside of this PicStack directory, I'll click on Select Folder, and at this point, everything we do will be saved in this directory. Let's move over to the next tab, which is Calibration. 
This is another thing you'll have to look at every single time. If you included dark frames or flat frames, then when you click on your light frames down here, they should be shown in green text. The green text confirms that all the settings were the same between your lights and your darks or your lights and your flats. If the text is not green and it's red, for example, then you'll need to make sure you're actually including the right calibration frames. Most of the time though, everything is configured properly straight out of the gate so you don't have to touch anything, with the exception of cosmetic correction. We'll talk about this in a minute. Moving over to post calibration, this is another very handy tab. It's telling me that my total integration time is 12 hours, 35 minutes. Most of that being H alpha data. For those that are shooting with a small focal length, you may have undersampled or blocky stars. If so, you can turn on drizzle. Drizzle will help to make those blocky stars a bit more spherical. It will also increase the processing time. So for this reason, I'm not gonna do it, but something to be aware of there. At this point, once you've confirmed everything, you can click on run in the lower right. It will then give you some warnings. In my case, it's giving me a lot of warnings because I didn't do any calibration frames, but when you're done with all that and you've confirmed things look good, we'll hit continue. And it starts off by measuring your photos. It wants to see how sharp the stars are, what the signal to noise ratio is, etc. And it will use these measurements to find your bad photos and then get rid of them automatically. Once it does that, it does the registration. It generates a reference image, which it will use for stacking. Then it does the local normalization, which helps to remove weird gradients, as I understand it. Then we have the integration. This is where it actually stacks all the data together. And then finally, at the end of the workflow, it crops out the edges, which don't have that much data, especially if you're doing dithering and your photos are shifting a lot between each photo. As I've said earlier, this could take anywhere from 15 or 20 minutes on the short end to 20 hours on the long end. And you may even get a scenario where the whole thing crashes just like that. I've never seen that before. Not quite sure what happened, to be honest, but that was definitely interesting. It could be a bug in the new version, which just came out, who knows, but I'm glad this is happening together in case it happens to you. You'll know you're not alone. This gives us a good segue though, because the next thing I want to talk about is cosmetic correction. One of the common problems that we all face in our photos are hot pixels. These hot pixels are identified as bright little dots throughout the photo. And so if we go to the process explorer and we type in cosmetic, we're looking for cosmetic correction. What you always want to do just to be safe is click on use auto detect Make sure you click on the checkbox and then click on the checkbox as well for hot sigma. This will allow WBPP to look for hot pixels and then remove them from your images. Next, you'll drag the triangle onto the background. And if you drag the triangle off onto the background, that should create a process. Let's rename it to cosmetic correction or CC or hot pixels, whatever makes sense to you. I'll go with CC for today. Then you can close out a cosmetic correction and we're gonna utilize this in WBPP. And all we've done is we've turned on use auto detect hot sigma. So for this, we'll go back to process explorer, type in weighted, find weighted batch pre-processing, open that up. It looks like we still have all of our lights, darks, whatever that was there before, although this is actually from Triangulum. So anyway, let's just recap very quickly. Now that you've seen the process, let's do it a lot faster. So step number one, add in your light frames. We'll click on the lights button, grab all of our light frames. Step number two, load in your calibration frames if you took them. That would be your flats, your darks, your dark flats. You'd click on the tab if you want to, click on the button at the bottom, load them in. When you've loaded in your lights and all your calibration frames, we'll move on to step number three. That is to confirm that the astrometric solution is set properly. Under image solver parameters, we confirm that the right ascension and declination match the fields here. In my case, we have 0, 43, 54, declination is 41, 1906. The date and time are more or less correct. I can always make them perfectly correct. And the focal distance and pixel size are good. When you've confirmed everything matches, we'll click on the red X to back out of this. Step number four is to specify an output directory. This is where we click on the folder icon. 
navigate to the main target directory, and then create a new folder called pickstack. In my case, I'll call it pickstack2 in this cone nebula folder. I know it's not where it needs to be, but you understand what we're doing. Now everything will be saved in a folder where we can find it. Step number five is to go to the calibration tab, click on one of your light frame headers, then go to cosmetic correction, choose CC, cosmetic correction, hot pixels, whatever you called it from earlier, and be sure to apply this to all light frames. Note how we have a little green check mark now for cosmetic correction. You shouldn't have to do anything else here, just confirm that your calibration frames have the green text to confirm that they match your light frames. Finally, we'll move over to the post calibration tab and take a look at the total integration time. This is a good way to confirm if you have enough data or not. You can also turn on drizzle. I'm not gonna bother today. And then we'll hit the run button in the lower right to begin our stack. Now it's gonna go through and this time, because we have cosmetic correction, it's going to fix the hot pixels first, then it will measure the photos, register them, stack them, etc. So I hope that explains the WBPP script here in PixInsight. One thing I want to caution you on though, if at any time you click on cancel, and then you try to stack the same data again, there's a very good chance you're going to get a bunch of failures and it's not going to stack. To be honest, I'm not sure what the underlying problem actually is, I just know what happens to myself and a lot of other people. So for this reason, I do not recommend you cancel for any reason. And if you do have to cancel, then you'll need to restart PixInsight, delete that PixStack folder, that way there's no traces of it, and you might even want to purge the cache, which I'm just going to cancel this and show you. You'll find the purge cache button here. To be honest, I don't know if it will actually do anything for us, but it's at least worth a shot. So I hope that explains everything about the stacking. Before we go though, there's one other thing that we should have talked about, but frankly, I always forget about it. And that's how to inspect your raw photos. This is always a very good thing to do right out of the gate. There's two different ways to inspect your photos. The first inside of PixInsight is called Blink. We can type in Blink up top. We'll double click on it from the menu down here. And with the Blink tool, we start by clicking on the folder icon. Now we're going to grab all of our light frames. I've got quite a few, as you can tell. It will automatically give us a preview of the first photo. And if we want to inspect these very quickly, we'll click on the play button. It's now going to run through every single image that we've taken so we can get a quick look. Because these were taken with different filters, the exposure is changing pretty dramatically. And we can't even tell what a lot of these photos are. So if this is a problem for you, if you click on the histogram button right here, this will ensure that every single photo is the same brightness. However, this can mask some problems with your data. Because if you're going through on the H alpha images, for example, and you can even just use a scroll wheel to go through these at your own speed. Uh, but see how this photo is much less contrasty than that one? That tells me maybe some high level clouds were blowing through. And if I identify that there's clouds in the photo and I don't want that image to be around anymore, I could delete image 14. Unfortunately, there's no easy delete button right here. So you either need to go back into your folder, look for 533H0014. I believe that is this image right here. And then I would delete that. This is assuming the photo is blurry or there's a lot of clouds or anything else. Understand though that when you delete the photo, it's still going to be here just because it's loaded into the temporary memory. Anyway, what I was trying to show you is that if you want to see everything at the same brightness, click on the histogram button. And now when you play through the photos, it's a bit easier to see what's going on. One of the common questions I get is, what about the planes or the satellites going through my photos? Do I need to delete them? And very often you don't have to worry about it because the stacking algorithms will be able to identify that those don't belong and remove them from the final photo. However, there will be times where these planes and satellites are still visible in your final stacked image. And unfortunately, what you might have to do is find the worst offending photos, delete them, and then restack the image data from scratch. That's very rare though that you have to do that. Again, most of the time, just leave the stuff here and it will be removed automatically. You can even zoom into the photo using the scroll wheel, which we turned on in the very first video in the course. That way you see your stars better. And see how we have some stuck pixels here that don't really move? That would be something that the cosmetic correction would help to fix. 
It's always a good idea to come through your photos, inspect them for any problems, and then delete the bad ones, just so there's no chance that they're included in your final stacked image. One of the problems I have with the Blink tool though is that it will not debayer your color photos, which makes it harder to see what's going on. For this reason, I recommend everybody download a free program called ASI Studio. ASI Studio is available on both Mac and Windows, and it does a great job. There's two main tools that I'm focused on today, which are the ASI Fits View and the ASI Deep Stack. Well, let's start with the ASI Fits View. When I click on Open Fits, I'm going to go through and find my directory with my light frames. And I can't select all my light frames, I can only select one, that's fine. I'll click on Open. And ASI Studio has automatically debayered my color images. That makes it much easier to see any problems in the data. So this is an alternate way to inspect your photos prior to stacking. You can come through here, zoom in if you want to, look for any star distortion, tracking errors, guiding errors, clouds, whatever. And if you find an image that just really does not belong in terms of the quality, you can click on the trash can and get rid of it. And for this reason, I actually find that ASI Fits View is a better way to inspect your color images. Here's another thing to keep in mind. If WBPP takes forever on your computer and you don't want to waste 20 hours stacking your data only to find a problem, you could always run ASI Deep Stack instead. This is by far the fastest and easiest stacking application out there. And with ASI Deep Stack, I'm just going to go through this very quickly because this is supposed to be a PixInsight video, but anyway, the reason I want you to at least be aware of this tool, again, is if you just want to quickly stack things together to confirm it looks good, you'll start by coming to the Light tab and click on it. Then choose Select Light. Find your directory with your photos that you want to stack together. These are all your light frames, of course. It automatically shows you a nice preview. So this will confirm you're actually working with the right images. Then you can load in your darks, flats, bias, or dark flats, whatever you might have as well. When you've loaded in your lights, darks, and whatever else you might have, all you have to do is click on the play button. And that's very strange. That one also crashed, just like WBPP. I don't know what's going on today, frankly. Anyway, I hope you're starting to understand why you might want to use ASI Deep Stack at least temporarily. That way you can confirm the stacked image looks halfway decent before you invest 15 or 20 hours in worst case scenario using PixInsight. And based on my tests, which I show in my Deep Space course, I found that PixInsight does give the best stacking results of any program. For this reason, I now use PixInsight for all of my stacking, even though it is a bit obtuse at the very beginning. Okay, before we go, I just want to do a very quick recap and make sure we're all on the same page. Step number one, you always want to inspect your photos manually and confirm they look good. Delete any bad photos. I'm talking weird stars, clouds, random things going through the photo, who knows. But don't get too worried about planes or satellites. Step number two, create a cosmetic correction. This is where we come to our process explorer and type in cosmetic correction. Turn on use auto detect. Hot Sigma, drag the triangle onto the background and call this CC or cosmetic correction, whatever. Step number three is to run weighted batch pre-processing. This is how we stack our photos in PixInsight. Step number four, I guess you could say, is to load in all of your lights, darks, flats, etc. Then in this case, step number five would be to confirm the astrometric solution, the coordinates and everything else are set correctly. Step number six would be to set a new output directory. That way you help to stay organized. Then you go to calibration, select one of your light frame headers, apply cosmetic correction to all of your light frames. Finally, look over the post calibration tab to confirm you have enough integration time and there's no other problems. And you can now run WBPP and stack your photos. The final thing I wanna talk about today is the end result of your stacking. Because if we take a look at my pick stack directory, we have multiple folders, cosmetized, registered. You might even have three or four extra folders as well. The problem is that the registered, the cosmetized, whatever else you might have, these are just temporary files as far as I'm concerned. And three weeks from now, you'll have no use for them. For this reason, I would recommend that if your stacked image looks good, you delete all of the folders except for the logs and the master. They are no longer required. The only reason you want to keep all these additional folders around is if you intend to stack the photos again in the future. This will help to speed up the process, especially if you're on an older computer. But for me, I don't need them anymore and they're just taking up a lot of space, so I'll delete them. And then inside my master folder, we've got a lot of images here. Which one do we actually need? 
Well, first up we have the reference frames. These are not really of any use for us other than troubleshooting. So I'm not saying you should delete them right away, but if you like your final stacked image, you don't really need these anymore. They're just taking up space. You could delete them if you want to. Then we've got our blue photo here. This is the master light, but we have another blue photo that's master light auto crop. The auto crop is generally the photo that you want to use. This is the final output image. To put this another way, if you're not sure what photos to use, sort by the date modified. Now everything at the top will be the most recently modified. Those are your final images. In my case, these are the auto crops. That's the easiest way to know which photos to use. And you can think of this logically. The older photos, these were the start of our stacking process. And then as it goes up, we reach the end of our stacking process. And depending on if you had drizzle turned on or anything else, the file name gets progressively longer. So another way to think about this is the longest file name is probably the one that you want. To keep it simple though, again, just sort by date modified. And if you have a color camera, you're just gonna have one image, the auto crop. But if you're on a monochrome camera, you'll have as many filters that you capture data with. All right, well, that's all I've got for you in today's video. I know that was a lot, but I wanted to be as thorough as possible and explain some of the troubles you might encounter. My final word is that Pix Insight does take a while to get the hang of it. And if it's taking hours and hours to stack your data, if that's just not worth it for you, then I actually think ASI Studio is a very decent alternative, the deep stack program that is. It doesn't have anywhere near the functionality of PixInsight, but the final image won't look necessarily that much worse than what you get out of PixInsight. So this is always a good fallback if you need to use it. But that's all I've got for you today. And in the following videos, we're gonna do our first full workflows where we process the images. So stay tuned, and I'll see you guys in another video.